Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we talk about literature. Today we are continuing our literary theory series. And I'm really mad that I named it that because I stumble over that title every single time I film. Today we are talking about annotating. This was one big request that came out of my time at BookNet Fest. Not only was it a question on my panel, but people were kind of looking for examples after the fact and talking to me about how do I annotate my books? How do I pay attention to what's important as I'm reading? How do I know how to identify that? Um, so I'm going to take you through my process. I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical part, and then I'm going to show you an example for the book that I'm currently reading, which is Jude the Obscure. All right the theoretical part. I kind of hit on this a little bit in my video, my first video in this series called Asking Good Questions. Um, I'll link that down below. In that video, I walk you through some different levels of thinking about literature. Um, that is the what, the how, and the why. Those same categories and those same questions in terms of what you're thinking about can comprise the majority of the types of notes that you're taking in a book. And um, even if you only settled there at the what, the how, and the why, digested that, and then applied that to the types of notes that you're taking, whether it be in the book at the time, on your digital device, on a notepad in the side, on a journal, on post-its, whatever your preferred medium is, um, it doesn't matter. But those are that's a really great framework for getting started. Another way to think about it is sort of not necessarily like in epistemological knowledge categories, but in the type of notes that you're taking. And so I went down and sat and took a look at how I take notes in a practical sense. And I realized that what I'm doing, what I'm enacting are really three things. I'm making observations, I'm asking questions, so that's where the what, the how, and the why come in, and then thirdly, I'm making connections to other things that I've read. I don't want to spend too much time on the theory, so let's jump into the current book that I'm reading. Like I said, Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, and I'll walk you through some of those techniques um, as, a, uh, as I do it. So let's take a look. All right guys, so here is my current read. So this was also something that came up on the panel discussion under a question about translations, but actually it kind of relates here. When you're reading a difficult book, having a good um, edition really helps. Obviously this is originally written in English, so this isn't a translation, but what a classic, um, publication like this will do for you, like Penguin Classics or Oxford Classics or whatever, is that they'll have a really good introduction that will help you understand the context and history around the novel and some of the major concepts in it. And they'll also have really good endnotes. So for something, Jude the Obscure, it's kind of old, having good endnotes that explain some of the references to other books that he's making that it will do translations of the random like Latin or French quotes that are in it super, super helpful. Um, so let's take a look inside. So uh, first of all, you notice that I use post-it notes. Post-it notes are my favorite. I think they're amazing. Um, one of the things that I do is I keep a post-it note with new words that I'm learning in the front or back cover. Um, and then I make flashcards for them because I'm a huge nerd and I miss school and school is the best. So that is um, a technique for learning new words and expanding your vocabulary. Um, this is an unusual one because a lot of times I don't necessarily mark something for a quote with a post-it note, but this was kind of uh, important for another project that I'm working on. And then I use a post-it note to mark my place in the book. I like that I can stick it right at the paragraph mark where I need to pick up reading again. Um, and then it also is useful for making notes on the side if I want have like universal notes. If I have notes that are related to the exact content on that page, I go ahead and make a note on that page. I am not picky about keeping my books pristine or pure or untouched. I find that the notes are really helpful when I come back and do a reread. Um, and then, yeah, so that's my personal preference. I certainly understand that a lot of people keep their books because they're beautiful, especially if you're doing like bookstagram or something like that, having a beautiful edition and just enjoying what books look like. That's totally a wonderful thing and I'm not judging it. So if you want to keep your books pristine and not actually make notes in the side, then post-it notes can kind of fill that gap for you. I think it's really important to have your notes in the context of what you're reading so that they're right there. An e-reader does a really great job for this too. You can take copious amounts of notes 
um, on your digital copy. Um, and the, obviously you could do you know, Evernote or have a journal on the side or whatever your flavor is if you like to keep notes that way. I do think having it outside of the context of the book is a little bit problematic because you may lose the journal or stop using the Evernote app or you know, whatever, then you have to pull it up when you do a reread and go find those notes again to expand upon your learning from the first time or second time that you've read it or whatever, however many times that you've read it before. Um, and so having it in the context of the book, I think is much more valuable than having it as a separate journal. But again, if you're taking notes, then you're absorbing that information a lot of times a lot better as well. So um, if that's really something that you feel strongly about, you like having an outside journal or note-taking app, then do what works for you. Hey, that's a neighbor getting into their car. Okay, so let's talk about the notes that are actually on this page. On the cover page, I often take notes that are going to be universal to the text as a whole. If I know that I want to, um, so for example, I'm calling this a realist's pilgrim progress, pilgrim's progress. So I've noticed that this book has some similarities to A Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, and that's in the overall form of the book, not just in one small allusion. Same thing, I know that Job is going to be important. That actually came out of the introduction. That was not an original thought to me. Um, and then also the idea of breaking through class. The classism of this novel is a universal theme that's running through the whole thing. So that's where I'm taking notes on universal themes that are ap applicable to the whole text. So here's a look at the introduction that was written for this particular edition. One of the notes that I tend to take, especially when I'm reading nonfiction, when I'm reading um, articles and journals about books or introductions, which basically function in a very similar way, is that I'll do a summary of a paragraph to make sure that I know what that make sure it's like almost like a checking for understanding within myself. Am I just letting these words like just gloss over me without me actually comprehending them? Or am I actually reading carefully and understanding the arguments that are being presented? So a lot of times I'll just do like a single word or a couple of words to summarize the argument that's being made in that paragraph. And it's something that I do throughout, right? Um, and that's just, again, my way of forcing myself to pay attention to what's on the page because a lot of times it's easy to kind of glaze your eyes over when you're working through this type of material. You'll notice that I do a lot of underlining as well, and that serves the exact same purpose as I'm underlining what I think is the most important point in that paragraph. Um, and again, just checking for understanding, making sure that I'm really distilling down the points that are being made. So here is the original like first page on the book. Thomas Hardy has chosen to include a quote, the letter killeth. So guess what? I'm going to think that's super important because he gave it this really, really primary spot in the text, the very first thing that the reader encounters. So here I know that he's making a reference to the letter, letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. This is a Christian and biblical perspective. So again, this idea of religion I know is going to be strong um, in, in, the, in this text. So I'm going to be paying attention to that. A preface, which I did not read because I got tired of reading stuff like this by the time that I got here. And then the first part, it's at Mary Green. So here I'm making a couple of notes about what I think the metaphorical representation or the association is that I have with these words. So on the one side, I have the association with Mother Mary, um, also Mary Magdalene, which I didn't make a note of, but that could be here as well. There's sort of a duality there. Pure, happy, you know, Mary, M-E-R-R-Y, which is a note that I make on the next page. Um, and then green, we have associations with freshness, innocent spring, the beginning, also paganism. So um, I'm kind of thinking about that as well. Again, if an author chooses to put a quote at the beginning of a section of a book, I'm going to pay attention to it because it's, in the author's minds, it's illuminating the main themes of what he's trying to communicate to us. And again, here I get the Mary Green, M-E-R-R-Y Green in here because there's a play on words there. Um, and, I'm, and for me, I'm actually thinking of um, not Tom Jones, but uh, another novel by Henry Fielding. Marymount is the name of the town that the main character st starts off on. And again, that's a play on words where it's either 
the Mount of Mary, where so it's a holy site where a church lives, or it's you Mount Mary and it's a religious pun. Um, and so on the flip side, a very like kind of low class thing to say, I guess, um, or a, a dirty joke, I sh that's really what I'm trying to say. So that's kind of in the fore of my mind as I'm thinking about, um, as I'm thinking about this, the name of this village, actually. Again, here we have me distilling down what I think this scene is representative of. So here we have this, um, in this piano that he got, this character bought in, with the attention of reading or playing, but never did. And so we have sort of like our am ambitions are our encumbrances. And now that he's moving, he's like, oh, what am I gonna do with this giant piano, right? Christminster is the name of the town. So again, um, I'm paying attention to the names of these places. This is obviously very metaphorical. So we have Christ minister, it's a religious setting. Again, I know that from the opening quote in the book that we're gonna be dealing with the religion again. Here is me just like paying attention to the plot points. So this is existing on the level of the what. Here I'm outlining, because this is going to be formative for the main character, right? So the first chapter is almost always really formative for the themes of the book, formative for the main character. That's where I make a ton of notes in a book. So here I'm just noting that this is part of what forms Jude into the character that he's going to become. And it's this, these pieces of advice, right? His first morals, his first lessons, um, they're all going to be important for that character. On the flip side, I'm also asking questions. So I noticed that this is the first piece of really long and in-depth imagery that Thomas Harding is employing in his novel. Before then, not a lot of description. So why is he spending all of this time describing this well? And that just piques my interest because it's different. It's a different tone. So I kind of go, oh, this must be important. Or, oh, he's shifting tone here. What is this for? What is this representative of? And I'm still not certain what it's representative of. I have a couple ideas, maybe a couple theories, but I leave it as a question there until I get deeper into the novel and maybe that will be revealed to me. And finally, I have this really long passage underlined and then a few notes about it. This is where it's talking about the local church. And again, because I know that this novel is a criticism on religion, because I know that that opening quote is talking about a Christian perspective, I'm paying attention anytime these long paragraphs come up that are dealing with the idea of religion. And I'm making some theories about the type of argument that he might be making. Here I'm paying attention to a literary technique that I think it's foreshadowing here. Um, and then this is coming back to that idea of an encumbrance. What are the things that hold us back? Um, what are the things that form us into a person that we're going to be? So here's also more encouragement and formation of the character of Jude. Here I noticed a shift in tone again, so I say it's childlike description. Um, here I've noticed that he's making an anti-industrial type argument. And here I notice that the story is very similar to Ruth, but it's sort of turned on its head and it's making this negative argument about marriage, which again, having this is my second time re reading this book, I know that marriage is a really important theme. So I'm paying attention to that upon my reread. These notes in black are the notes that I've made the second time. These notes in purple are the ones that I made the first time through. You can see how much more I get out of the book on a second reading just by looking at that page. Really recommend it. Here we have more formation of the character of Jude. Um, here we have, yeah, again, Jude is sort of caught between these authorities of what he should be doing, people giving multiple pieces of advice. How does he know what the right thing is to do? Here I've identified um, a form of irony, again, some conflict. Here I've sort of noted that he's making an argument um, almost like based on the competitive nature of nature. So we've got religion maybe versus a more Darwinistic view of the world that's coming through in this area. Um, and it's a, the, almost like a worldview building. He's building the worldview of Jude. So there's a lot of moralistic arguments here. And so you kind of have to like pull them out to see how does Jude view the world and why is he the, the way that he is.
Yeah, here again, I identify some more evolutionary arguments. Here we have a sense of narrow-mindedness. Here I'm talking about class, the class aspect of the um, novel. Again, metaphor for the city of God, disenchantment, heaven is a lie, maybe. So I, all of this religious language is sort of like formulating as I'm reading through this novel. And finally, the final note that I want to go over with you guys is this throwback to medieval allegorical plays. This is sort of where it clicks in my mind that it's very similar to Pilgrim's Progress or Pierce Plowman, something like that. Now, the reason why I didn't make this connection before is because I originally read this book in a Victorian literature class during my English degree. And it, since I've taken that class, I later took a medieval literature course, which caused me to read Pierce Plowman and A Pilgrim's Progress. And so one thing that's really, really helpful is having contextual knowledge for literature. And I talked about this a little bit when I was announcing my project to read through the Western canon, but reading in historical order, oops, I just knocked my camera. Reading in a historical order is actually really, really useful because future books comment upon what happened before, not the other way around, because obviously those books didn't exist, so how can they comment on them that there's no time travel, right? So reading books in historical order really helps to illuminate this progress through ideas. It really reveals this conversation about what is good, what is true, what is beautiful that's been happening through the whole history of human discourse. And literature gives us a view in that, into that. So it's not merely about what is happening in this book right here, but how is this book encountering ideas that have come before, modifying them, changing them, refuting them, dealing with the ideas that it's dealing with in its own culture? So I know the historical context of Victorian England is highly religious, but also Darwin's Origin of the Species has been published. All of this is contributing to the whole confluent, oh man, is contributing to the whole confluence of ideas that Hardy is expressing here. And so having that contextual knowledge of history and literature is a huge, huge advantage when encountering texts like this. So that's what I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed that practical peek inside of my book, inside of what I'm doing inside while I read. I hope this video was useful and helpful. If you have any questions about what I talked about today, or if you want to ask me about how you annotate your books and say, am I doing this quote unquote right? We can talk about that in the note, in the comment section below. You can find me online at a lovely jaunt everywhere. So whether that's Twitter, you want to hit me up there. I'm a lovely jaunt at gmail.com. You can email me. Finally, if you get value out of these videos, please, you know, do the subscribe, like, share, but also you can check out my Patreon if you find that some of those tiers, that extra content that I'm creating on that level is useful for you as well. Consider becoming a patron of this channel so I can keep bringing great content to you guys. Until next time, I'm Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.